The COVID-19 pandemic is accelerating digitalization, transforming how we work, socialize, and create economic value. Today, tech companies play a leading role in the global economy. They optimize business operations to expand markets, connect people, and empower small businesses. Digital platforms also deliver essential services, including critical ones like health and education. They provide credit to SMEs by utilizing data on their operations. They also create entirely new jobs, unheard of just a few years ago. Consumers, businesses, households, and governments alike enjoy many benefits from digital platforms. However, digital platforms disrupt markets and businesses. Increasingly, online businesses contribute to shop closures and the loss of jobs. They also create gig work with little job security or protection. Regulators still need to resolve tax leakages and big tech erodes domestic competition for some countries. There are issues surrounding loss of privacy, cybersecurity, and misinformation. Also, the gap between the tech haves and the tech have-nots could exacerbate inequality. Internet access must be made more inclusive across developing Asia. Closing the digital divide particularly for women and the elderly, is critical. How can we all work together to ensure digital platforms promote inclusive development in Asia and the Pacific? To find out, read the latest Asian Economic Integration Report. Good morning. I hope you're all doing really well today. Um, our Asian Impact webinar today launches the latest edition of the Asian Economic Integration Report. Now, this yearly report from the Asian Development Bank looks at the flows of people, investments, and goods across the uh, Asia and the Pacific region. Now, all of that, of course, has been vastly disrupted by the COVID-19 pandemic. And we're here today really to talk about how the region can together recover and reconnect. Um, we'll also be talking about digital platforms and digitalization. You saw the video just now, hopefully. And we'll be looking at how that can help transform the region's economy and help it get back on its feet. Now, the report is on the ADB website. Please do take a look at your leisure, but we want to hear from you as well. So there is a, a chat box on the right-hand side Please do put your questions in there. We'll get to as many as we possibly can. If you see a question that you like, please do put the thumbs up there because that pushes it to the top and means that we can get to more questions and more topics. So uh, please do think about your questions, put them in there. But first, we're going to hear straight from the ADB experts on this regional cooperation and integration topic. Of course, they are Yasuyuki Sawada. He is the chief economist here at the Asian Development Bank. He's also the director general of the Economic Research and Regional Cooperation Department. And with him is Sinyong Park. She's also an expert in this area. <clears throat> Excuse me. She's the director of the regional cooperation division within that same department. <clears throat> Over to you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Karen. Uh, good morning, uh, good afternoon, and good evening. Uh, thank you very much, everyone, for joining in this um, launching a webinar of Asian Econ Integration Report, in short, AEIR uh, 2021. So let me start my uh, presentation. Uh, first, uh, since it was um, uh, first very first reported in December 2019, the coronavirus pandemic, uh, COVID-19, has infected more than 100 million uh, people and claimed the lives of more than 2 million um, uh, people. Uh, the virus uh, spread rapidly across the globe, shutting down or affecting almost all the spheres of human activities. In Asia, containment measures have gradually eased into October and November after the uh, April uh, peak, uh, but measures tightened again in December 2020. So can you uh, move on to uh, slide number three? 
So left chart uh, shows the uh, what I just said. Uh, uh, containment measures have been uh, uh, gradually, you know, peaked. Um, uh, uh, you can see a peak of a uh, containment uh, stringency uh, in Asian Pacific in April last year, and then the measures um, uh, gradually relaxed, uh, especially October, November. Then uh, we see uh, measures tightened again in December uh, last year, as well as earlier uh, this year. Uh, COVID-19 and that stringent containment measures severely disrupted Asia's uh, cross-border flows and activities in 2020. Uh, border closures, uh, lockdowns, quarantines, and other measures to control a virus spread disrupted supply chain, weakened demand, and intensified uncertainties. This resulted in overall decline in global trade, a drop in cross-border investment, reversal of uh, foreign portfolio financial flows at the on onset of pandemic, and tight uh, travel restrictions, as we can see from the uh, right chart uh, in this uh, slide. Consequently, uh, ADV estimated developing Asia contracted in 2020 for the very first time in the last uh, six decades. So turning to the next um, uh, slide, slide number four, amidst a global pandemic, many Asian economies have leveraged better infrastructure and technology in order to allow for faster and cheaper domestic and cross-border connections. New technologies, digitalization, and service trade can connect global economies even closer and provide new cha channels of uh, global linkages. Uh, this ongoing pandemic also highlights the contribution of digital services in enabling economic activities such as e-health, online education, telework, and online meetings, including ours, uh, despite containment measures. The COVID-19 pandemic provides an opportunity for greater global and regional cooperation, specifically in the listed three areas here. Number one, containing and uh, suppressing the virus. Number two, strengthening global and regional supply chain. Uh, and number three, increasing resilience and, uh, to uh, natural hazards and uh, health risks. So moving to um, uh, next slide, uh, slide number six, let's look at the progress of regional cooperation and integration before COVID-19 and also after COVID-19. Before the pandemic, Asia's regional cooperation has progressed steadily in trade, FDI, finance, and tourism, as you can see from this slide, comparing the figures from uh, year 2001 up until 2019. But the pandemic impact has been uh, quite substantial. Um, uh, in next uh, slide, I'm showing um, 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 a new index uh, in order to capture the pre-COVID uh, uh, progress of uh, regional cooperation and integration uh, systematically. Uh, we constructed um, uh, this uh, index and we can see uh, this uh, Asia Pacific Regional Cooperation and Integration Index, what we call Archie Index. This is a multi-dimensional index uh, tracking progress. Uh, on a set of uh, six relevant dimensions of regional integration, including uh, uh, trade and investment, and the other five um, uh, dimensions, as uh, you can see from the uh, right end of this uh, 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 slide. Latest ARCH uh, estimate indicate regional integration in Asia rose slightly in year 2018, as you can see from the left chart, uh, due mainly to the rebound in money and uh, financial dimensions, Convergence of interest rate and recovery in cross-border liability in some Asian economies between 2017 and 2018 partly explain this improvement in overall uh, uh, degree of uh, regional cooperation integration. Regional integration in Asia increased for most sub-regions in uh, year 2018, as you can see from the left chart again, uh, but the sub-regional results uh, uh, remain uh, wide ranging. Uh, with uh, East Asia and uh, Southeast Asia outperforming other regions across most uh, dimensions, as you can see from left chart as well as a uh, right chart. Uh, overall, we observe uh, in the right panel contribution of movement of people, infrastructure and connectivity, as well as trade and investment continue to drive uh, regional integration in Asia and the uh, uh, Pacific. So next chart uh, also um, uh, summarize um, uh, overall Archie index. Our spatial autocorrelation analysis of Arch, uh, spatial uh, pattern of, uh, uh, you know, across the space, what is the Arch index tells us. 
Uh, this um, uh, uh, chart suggests, or analysis suggests, uh, regional integration efforts in neighboring countries can create synergy across borders. Uh, there are positive spillovers in regional integration for any economy when neighboring countries have high regional integration. Um, uh, this is exactly what we observed here, uh, where dots uh, in this chart represent the arch score of each country. The larger the dot, uh, that means the higher the arch score, level of uh, regional integration in different uh, dimensions. We observe economies with low and high arch scores seems to be clustered together. And uh, this uh, really uh, highlights uh, positive spillover effects. Um, next chart, I'd like to um, um, uh, briefly touch upon about the RCEP, uh, Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership. RCEP was signed uh, 15 no 15th of November last year, 2020, by members of ASEAN, Association of Southeast Asian Nations, Australia, Japan, New Zealand, People's Republic of China, and Republic of Korea. RCEP is the largest free trade agreement in human history, involving about 30% of global GDP and uh, about the same uh, proportion of global population. As it combines the existing bilateral agreements between ASEAN members and its five major trading partners, RCEP will be an important step, stepping, stepping stone or a, a building block towards the open integrated uh, economic system in Asia and Pacific. As you can see, or as we can see from the right chart, RCEP can potentially generate enormous income gains uh, to not only uh, to Asia and Pacific, but also the rest of the world. RCEP could further promote trade in the region by strengthening regional production networks through greater harmonization regulation and uh, policies across members. The unified rules of origin will likewise reduce export costs within its membership. Asia needs to embrace stronger trade liberalization and facilitation efforts which includes pursuing trade agreements, in particular regional and mega trade deals such as RCEP. So this is a, a, a brief picture of a pre-COVID-19 situation in regional uh, integration. So let's uh, move on to discuss during the post-COVID-19 trade supply chain investment. Sinyong, uh, floor is yours. Well, let us uh, take a closer look at trade supply chain and investment um, during and after the full, uh, pandemic. Next slide, please. The trade has been hit hard during the pandemic, uh, especially due to widespread lockdowns, border closures, travel restrictions, and stricter quarantine measures. After hitting the bottom in May 2020, though, the Asia's experts started to regain uh, its strength quite uh, robustly as uh, global demand, um, especially the medical supplies and then equipment uh, and electronic goods have been rising. The Asia's import have also shown uh, strength again, led by increasing industrial production uh, in the manufacturing sector, especially in uh, China, PRC, and uh, other economies. The uh, high frequency data that uh, we collected, uh, such as uh, global shipping and packaging indexes or port calls, uh, show that the trade growth uh, could be much faster uh, than anticipated. But we continue to see uh, ups and downs of the pandemic, and there's a risk of a double dip recession, uh, which could weigh on the sustained recovery of Asia's trade. Next slide, please. The, uh, there are major uh, driving forces that could shape um, the global and Asia's trade landscape post-pandemic. First, the momentum of globalization uh, is likely to be reconsidered by many economies. Uh, we do believe that the globalization will continue to progress, but it may do so in a different shape. Uh, secondly, the supply chains are expected to undergo a significant uh, reshaping to minimize risks from uh, disruptions. It could take the form of visualization, reshoring, and or diversification of global supply chains. Thirdly, the pandemic has accelerated digitalization of economies. We have seen uh, digital technology to be very useful and helpful uh, for us to deal with the pandemic situation. And then uh, it also helped us 
strengthen the cross-border trade transactions. But these will uh, increasingly uh, rise, and then uh, the trade will increasingly depend on the digital tools and real-time data. And in addition, behind the border bottlenecks and the non-tariff measures remain crucial issues to tackle uh, in order to shore up the trade growth. Next slide, please. Uh, we have seen uh, severe disruptions in the global supply chain. Uh, there is a risk of the global supply chain, uh, the vulnerable to any disruption in any country. The countries could use reshoring as a means to uh, the, uh, minimize some of these uh, risks of disruption, and that could potentially uh, the weigh on the trade growth across Asia. In our simulation, it shows uh, if uh, 10 or 20 percent of uh, global supply chain uh, become reshored to home countries, that means that uh, global trade will be estimated to contract by 13 to 22 percent. So even more than the, uh, the reduction in the uh, global supply chain. Uh, this is uh, due to um, strength of uh, the intermediate this trade in uh, total trade. Next slide. Yes. Uh, FDI flows are estimated to have contracted in 2020. FDI performance up to the third quarter of uh, last year uh, show the validity of this uh, gloomy prospect of uh, FDI inflows, both globally and into Asia. Uh, as you can see that the especially uh, hit uh, area was greenfield investment. However, we see a quite robust recovery of uh, uh, FDI in the form of uh, m and uh, especially already into the, uh, the second quarter and the third quarter, uh, we have seen a strong uh, m and deals, uh, which in Asia amounted to 58 billion and 43 billion respectively. And uh, this is uh, probably reflecting the uh, uh, in the low low prices uh, in uh, Asia, and also uh, the investors attracted to uh, the bargain hunting uh, during the uh, uh, pandemic uh, induced a better valuation in the market. And uh, many of these uh, FDI uh, the M and A deals were in uh, communication and electronic components among others. Next slide, please. Uh, despite these uh, um, the positive uh, signs of a recovery, uh, the number of non-tariff measures imposed on Asia have increased significantly over the past few years, even before the pandemic. And uh, this has taken the form of anti-dumping safeguard measures, sanitary and phytosanitary measures, and the technical barriers to trade. On trade facilitation front, uh, the recent uh, survey done by uh, ESCAP shows that there's a significant progress being made toward the streamlining trade procedures in the region. Nevertheless, the implementation varies across groups of uh, different measures. Cross-border paperless trade measures, such as electronic exchange of uh, certificates of origin and or sanitary uh, phytosanitary certificates, have been initiated uh, in less than 40% of the regional economies. And this has been only on, also on a pilot basis. Um, there are uh, greater room for improvement, especially for the uh, trade facilitation measures targeting at the SMEs, women-owned firms, and trade finance. Next slide, please. There, Pandemic uh, has highlighted the potential of digital technology and digital trade. Uh, digital uh, use of the digital tools, uh, especially for uh, trade and then uh, sales are increasingly important. Uh, we've seen uh, some uh, early survey results uh, showing that uh, there are many uh, B2B companies have moved their uh, business and operation activities to an online space. 
uh, this uh, shown in the uh, left hand chart. In fact, uh, uh, we noticed that uh, there has been a decline in an in-person interaction uh, towards more uh, the distance model of sales after the breakout of the uh, pandemic. Remote sales, which can be done through the phone or internet, have definitely taken off. And then this will likely stay even post pandemic. Uh, last April 2020, this uh, chart shows that uh, uh, you know, McKinsey's uh, Pulse survey from uh, more than uh, 3,600 uh, 3, B2B uh, companies around the world. And then that shows that uh, you know, significant shift to the uh, online space for their operation. There are five reform areas to unlock the potential of this uh, digital trade. First, we need to increase investment in digital infrastructure and connectivity to broaden physical access to mobile and internet networks. Secondly, we need to enhance digitally enabled financial services and e-payment options to facilitate the digital transactions and support the digital economy. Thirdly, we need to make investment investment uh, in logistics and then delivery infrastructure, including the application of uh, digital solution in customs and border procedures. And fourth, with increasing cross-border digital transactions, it's likely uh, more critical uh, to strengthen international tax cooperation and harmonization to plug loopholes and properly capture the profits generated by the digital economy. Many economies already suffer uh, from uh, the, you know, the domestic uh, revenue uh, in, uh, in, during the pandemic uh, to uh, provide more uh, social protection and uh, increase the, uh, uh, the public uh, investment. Lastly, policymakers should be more flexible when setting policies and regulations and working together with the private sector to build open and innovative ecosystems for platform businesses. Um, next slide, please. Together with trade, FDI have been playing a pivotal role in Asia's growth, and it will do so in post-pandemic recovery. Asia has generally um, imposed the higher restrictions to ADB compared to more industrialized economies, especially in services sector. And this have been uh, through a higher foreign equity limitation and uh, more screening mechanisms and then other operational uh, restrictions. In, but in 2020, uh, the pandemic has brought even greater investment uh, policy measures that tend to be more restrictive in Asia Pacific. Um, at the, uh, on the other hand, the measures toward improving the investment facilitation remain quite slow and then show large variations uh, in the region. Uh, that the large sort of variation in the region is shown on, on the uh, right-hand side. These measures include, for example, the strengthening investment promotion agencies, the adoption of investor-friendly protocols, uh, and the use of digital tools to expedite investment application, or better investment uh, interagency coordination. So the region can do more to adapt and render more flexible investment policy framework. Next slide, please. We can use uh, better investment treaty regimes to improve this investment um, the environment uh, for the region to attract more foreign investment. Uh, there are particularly uh, important uh, measures that uh, to safeguard the uh, economic interest of uh, both states and an investor. The investor state uh, disputes are likely to rise post pandemic and the better design and negotiation of the investment agreement uh, will help us uh, to secure, uh, in, uh, secure more foreign direct investment uh, without uh, in incurring too much cost due to the investor state uh, disputes. Next slide, please. The, at the international level, there is a, a concern that the uh, COVID-19 crisis could trigger an increase in investor state disputes. For this reason, reason uh, particularly, we need to modernize investment provisions in the current and then future investment agreements. 
for example, the COVID crisis uh, underscores how important it is for the states to maintain a degree of flexibility regarding some provision, especially the national treatment or expropriation, so that the regulator, regulatory measures for the public interest can be taken in exceptional circumstances. We can also uh, use more of uh, investor state arbitration. The reforms of uh, international investment regimes can be undertaken uh, and states can uh, continue upgrading dispute mechanisms, for example, increasing the control and transparency of settlement procedures and improving the selection of arbitrators and settling disputes through other mechanisms. Next slide, please. So let me summarize the key messages of uh, the report. Asia's trade hit hard during the pandemic, but show a signs of robust recovery uh, post pandemic. Uh, but the reconfiguration of uh, global supply chain post pandemic will continue to pose challenges to the region's trade landscape. The emphasis on the reduction of uh, non-tariff measures and digitalization can reduce behind the border bottlenecks, improve trade logistics and efficiency, and promote digital trade in goods and services. RCEP is a good example of how the, uh, the region's commitment to open and more uh, harmonious trade regime can help the region's pandemic response better by building trade and economic resilience. FDI is uh, estimated to have contracted significantly in 2020, but we see the pickup in M&A deals in Q2 and Q3 and shows that the you know, strong fundamental always work for the region. Asia should improve the investment climate and leverage investment treaties to attract investment uh, in the, uh, also especially high quality investment to the region. And finally, in order to seize the potential of digital transformation, the region needs to address the varying e-readiness issues and narrow digital divide across and within countries. This wraps up our presentation and we're happy to entertain any questions. Thanks very much, uh, Sinyang Pence Yasu. Uh, just to let everybody know that the report is already on the ADB website, www.adb.org. You should see it right at the top of the page. Uh, if you click onto that, you'll be able to access the news release. In terms of the slides, the presentation, uh, that uh, the slides and this video indeed will also be on the adb.org uh, website shortly after we conclude at the top of the hour. Now, I was just looking at some of the questions come in, uh, Yasu and Sinya. We do have quite a few on uh, reshoring, and you mentioned also nearshoring uh, in the report. I guess bringing uh, bringing your supply uh, suppliers close to home rather than right uh, in country. Uh, can you talk a little bit about uh, the levels of reshoring that you see. Some people are suggesting that these numbers uh, are not really very realistic. Well, um, well, this uh, wasn't really based on the, uh, the you know, the uh, any econometric model or uh, evidence uh, based on survey to show like uh, how much is uh, um, you know the would be the appropriate level of reshoring, but. The uh, actually the finding for us is uh, important because it shows that the, you know if you actually uh, reduce the global trade because of reshoring ten percent, that's going to have a even greater. There's a spillover effect through the regional value chain for Asia. Ten percent will translate to thirteen percent of uh, regions trade. And then 20% in the global reshoring is going to translate to 22% of contraction in the regional uh, you know, trade. So there are a bit greater spillover effects uh, through the regional value chain and then global value chain that affects the uh, region significantly because the intermediate goods trade in Asia really are quite uh, significant. This uh, uh, in across, a, especially Southeast Asia and East Asia, um, the intermediate trade, it's uh, nearing like 70% of the total trade. So if there's a reshoring happening, then that's going to have a quite a significant uh, spillover cascading effect throughout the region. 
and then uh, affects uh, Asia's trade uh, and that export capacity quite significantly. Right, right. I mean, um, somebody else mentions, you know, that the COVID is um, once in a century or hopefully once in a lifetime event. I mean, do you really think that reshoring is going to uh, be, be permanent? Will, will, will companies be looking to uh, redirect, reorganize their value chains, their supply chains permanently, or is this a temporary phenomenon? Well, I don't really think the pandemic will be the once in a lifetime. Uh, unfortunately, many have already um, argued that, uh, and then now, uh, you know, this uh, pandemic might be the first, but not be the last. We should be more prepared. Uh, both business sector and the government are considered much more uh, important uh, uh, that, uh, you know, we have to make sure that the, the value chains are more resilient. And reshoring is a part of the strategies that the both private sector and the government are using to increase the resilience of the supply chain. And I don't believe that uh, this will just uh, you know, go away because the pandemic is over. In May, uh, especially even like, uh, you know, I, we see that uh, uh, some, uh, uh, you know, some uh, newspaper uh, indicating that, uh, you know, the United States are also considering uh, what would be uh, ways of, uh, you know, strengthening the resilience of the supply chain. Uh, and many uh, businesses are considering that. It's a part of uh, those, uh, you know, long-term strategies for those uh, businesses and also the uh, governments. Right, right. Yeah, thanks very much. Yes, if I could ask you um, your view on this. We've got a question in, in from Vu Nam uh, asking, will the uh, reshaping of the globalization, the global supply chains be short term or long term? Your view? Yes, thank you. Thank you very much. I think uh, we have done what we have done for reshoring is a scenario analysis. So depending on um, a scenario, what's the likely impact we uh, estimated. So I think uh, this, uh, I, I believe that this can give uh, uh, some concrete uh, impact assessment. Um, I, I think uh, reshoring, uh, there is um, uh, definitely a short term um, uh, uh, tendency, uh, but at the same time, as we observe uh, last half of last year, uh, year 2020, strong bounce back of uh, Asian trend, uh, uh, global as well as especially trading Asian Pacific region. Um, uh, notably uh, PPE uh, and uh, medical uh, face mask and uh, medical uh, products, as well as uh, electronics uh, uh, products. We see a particularly very strong uh, uh, bounce back, uh, in, especially in East Asia and Southeast Asia. I think that indicates, uh, uh, you know, uh, not only government, but also private sector uh, reaffirming the benefit of uh, international trade. So in that respect, I would say, uh, 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 you know, a risk of uh, permanent uh, substantial reshoring tendency uh, that may be, um, uh, you know, the scenario with a uh, uh, slim probability. Right, right. Thanks very much. Um, I want to stick with this topic. We've got a question in here from Warren, and I'm going to read it out uh, word for word. He asks, how can a geographically isolated country like the Philippines I think we all feel a little bit geographically isolated at the moment, right? But how can a geographically isolated country like the Philippines participate more efficiently and effectively uh, in this post-pandemic round of globalization, specifically uh, Philippines focused? I'll uh, toss that to either of you. <laughs> well, uh, let me um, give you first uh, um, take on this. In fact, um, you know, I, I do believe that the Philippines has a strong potential, mm -hmm. given that the uh, post-pandemic trade landscape uh, will uh, give a more weight on the digital and services trade, and uh, in in uh, in all respect, actually, the uh, Philippines. Uh, has a comparative advantage in the services sector, and then they are um, pro. They are really, um, you know, service oriented, and then uh, um, in terms of uh, even uh, you know uh, export of a lot of uh, uh, service personnel, uh, you know, and even when they are not exporting, <laughs> there is uh, also offshore call center. They can uh, provide the uh, services from uh, the Philippines uh, to the world, and uh, these uh, are really some of the potentially uh, 
uh, good areas to benefit from a uh, different form of globalization, more digitally connected globalization uh, post COVID. Thanks very much. Um, and I realize that I'm, uh, I'm ignoring the top, <laughs> the top couple of questions here, but that's cr because I'm trying to stick to the topics. But yeah, so I'd like to throw to you next, if I could. There's an enormous question here uh, asking whether it's possible that countries will try to um, decrease their reliance on, uh, on the PRC on China, because you know, obviously a lot of the production has been put on pause uh, due to the pandemic. And if that uh, is the case, will there be opportunities for other Asian countries uh, to become you know, stronger uh, in the production chain or to become production hubs? Uh, I think um, uh, probably it's not um, uh, right to answer whether it's desirable or not. I think uh, uh, market forces um, can let uh, you know, resource allocation basically guide resource allocation and uh, private investment. So, uh, so far, China has been uh, sort of a full set economy, producing a lot of a wide variety of uh, parts and intermediate products and uh, uh, final products. So naturally, uh, other Asian countries are deeply involved uh, tight uh, production network uh, with China. But uh, even before uh, COVID-19, we see, you know, China is, uh, has been upgrading uh, its uh, uh, industrial structure and also technological level. So shifting from a labor intensive products production to more capital in intensive or service driven and a domestic market driven economy. And then uh, as a result, uh, supply chain networks in Asia has been uh, changing. I think uh, um, uh, uh, right way uh, to uh, uh, view uh, or watch uh, the situation is uh, to support uh, already emerging uh, reorganization of uh, a supply chain network. And I believe um, uh, you know, uh, private sector and the market forces really are moving towards a more resilient uh, uh, supply chain network. And then COVID-19 also, uh, you know, there are some uh, short-term uh, um, uh, uh, like uh, direction towards uh, uh, reshoring, but at the same time, uh, everything. Uh, and then, as I mentioned, you know, a benefit of uh, uh, more robust uh, uh, international trade exists and um, a market uh, reaffirmed this uh, trend. So that's why we are seeing a, a strong bounce back. So I, I would see uh, there will be a summary organization of a, a supply chain network. But I think, uh, I hope with this uh, RCEP and uh, broader uh, international cooperation framework, this reorganizing um, uh, supply chain network will uh, move towards the right direction. Right, yes, thank you, Avzi. I'm sure we'll come back to the, the RCEP and the CPTPP issues later because it has been in the news quite a lot recently. But let me go to our top question here. It's an anonymous question, but uh, the question is, have NTMs become more stringent because of virus fears, i.e. in packaging, sanitization, et cetera? NTMs are non-tariff measures, I assume. I think we can uh, probably put up uh, uh, slides uh, if uh, possible. Uh, we, uh, we had uh, this chart showing that uh, increasing trend of uh, uh, non-tariff uh, measures. And uh, if um, uh, maybe we can check later on. So left chart, uh, you know, uh, there is a different component of uh, non-tariff measures and top component is sanitary and phytosanitary uh, measures. Uh, in terms of uh, a number of uh, uh, non-tariff uh, measures related to actually, uh, slide, I think slide number 15, um, uh, the measure related to uh, uh, sanitary and phytosanitary uh, 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 rules um, uh, already, uh, uh, you know, somewhat substantial uh, before uh, COVID-19 year 2015. So top uh, blue part is uh, sanitary and phytosanitary. And uh, actually this uh, part uh, has the same uh, 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 number even uh, after outbreak of uh, COVID-19. So, so far we don't see any uh, specific, uh, uh, you know, uh, increase or jump um, uh, uh, in uh, sanitary, sanitary measures due to uh, COVID-19. Thanks, thanks very much, Yasu. Um, there's another question here, um, specifically talking about protectionist measures with relation to PPE, uh, personal protective equipment, uh, masks, and so forth. Uh, are there, there have been disruptions right uh, early on in the pandemic period. We're, we're all very aware of that. Uh, is that still going on? Um, and do you think that this will be the case uh, with vaccines? 
Well, compared to 2019, there have been actually quite a significant uh, increase in uh, non-tariff measures and especially for the medical supplies. Um, and uh, but in fact, like across Asia, those are uh, non-tariff me uh, measures and also the trade uh, you know, uh, measures, newly introduced trade measures tend to be more liberalizing rather than restrictive. Uh, in Asia, especially uh, targeted at the, um, the medical supplies. So uh, then that actually suggests that uh, many Asian economies try to be more accom accommodating uh, in terms of the trade of uh, medical supplies uh, and including the vaccine. Um, but uh, unfortunately, there are actually more restrictive measures imposed on uh, food. <laughs> during the pandemic. Uh, and uh, a lot of these uh, new measures are uh, um, at least uh, suggesting that, uh, you know, we need to have a stronger international cooperation uh, to facilitate the uh, flow of uh, especially critical essential goods, uh, such as medical supplies and then uh, uh, food and agricultural products. And uh, hopefully uh, the, you know, some of those uh, uh, in institutionalizing and uh, international cooperation can be facilitated in the, uh, the RCEP uh, or CPTPP uh, framework going forward. Okay, yeah, thanks very much. And um, we have a question from Danny Burrows on this similar uh, related topic. The question is, are the FDI and trade protectionist measures responding to COVID-19 and therefore are hopefully temporary? Um, or do they signal uh, a move towards broader protectionism in the region? I think this goes back to the question about, you know, is this a one-off temporary event or are we seeing permanent shifts um, in this thing? But over to you, what do you think? Well, again, uh, as mentioned that, uh, you know, a lot of uh, trade measures have been introduced during the pandemic also. Uh, a lot, in fact, including the uh, uh, in uh, measures on uh, the uh, foreign investment. Uh, and unfortunately, there have been uh, half of them uh, more restrictive compared to uh, another half of being uh, trying to be more liberalizing and then accommodating. Uh, a lot of those uh, definitely uh, would be uh, re look at uh, after the uh, COVID and hopefully uh, with greater uh, regional cooperation and more uh, multilateralized the uh, trading uh, regime and then rules can uh, mitigate uh, the uh, harmful effect of uh, long-term uh, measures sustained after the COVID pandemic. Mm, sure. Yes, you, you agree? Uh, yes. And uh, also I uh, uh, would say uh, from uh, trade data, high frequency trade data already, um, uh, uh, trades are bouncing back and returning back, uh, uh, not fully, but uh, to some extent, substantially. Uh, closer to uh, pre-COVID-19 trend. I think that um, shows itself, uh, you know, a private sector and governments uh, basically uh, reaffirming benefits of uh, uh, open uh, uh, and, uh, you know, more, uh, uh, you know, uh, tighter uh, trade uh, transactions. So sure. I agree with uh, Xin Yang. Yeah, sure, sure. Um, well, you, you both mentioned the slight uptick in trade uh, you mentioned a slight uptick in uh, M&A mergers and acquisitions activity uh, towards the end. We have a question here about uh, whether the increase uh, in M&A into Asia uh, versus the de decrease in greenfield investments, um, as shown on one of the slides, is a good sign for the region. And if so, why that should be. Perhaps I can well, talk that to you, Sin Young. Yes, um, you know, in fact, uh, you know, m and uh, given the recovery of the financial markets and uh, in, uh, there was uh, quite a uh, flow uh, from uh, investors uh, to buy um, the uh, Asia businesses on uh, relatively uh, lower prices. And uh, that's was the main driver for the uh, recovery in an M&A. Uh, we do believe that uh, as the trade uh, does uh, recover, uh, given also the uh, recovery of uh, global demand, uh, greenfield investment will likely return as well. Um, we don't really think like, you know, the greenfield uh, um, investment will just uh, stay uh, uh, sluggish. It's taking a bit longer because uh, still there's a lot lockdown, there's, uh, you know, the difficulty in, uh, uh, you know, travel, uh, the investors will still have uh, difficulty coming and then, uh, you know, making the final sort of, uh, you know, the um, final sort of agreement and then contract. 
uh, in uh, that sort of a situation. Uh, but uh, as the global recovery uh, you know, take place with um, rapid uh, vaccination, hopefully, uh, the investment uh, in both uh, Greenfield and then m &A will likely return. Okay. Oh, thanks very much. Um, back to some of these reassuring questions. I think it's it's very much on people's minds. That's why we're getting a lot of these questions coming in. Um, the question is um, from Warren, can the panel say which countries are most vulnerable to economic losses because of reshoring? Um, well, you know, this uh, was really like a, the simulation uh, that we have done. And according to the simulation uh, results, um, the countries that uh, rely more heavily on the uh, global regional value chain are going to be more affected. That means uh, countries in Southeast Asia, uh, also countries in uh, Central Asia, because they have a uh, high integration with the European uh, value chain. Um, so Malaysia, Singapore, like Korea, you know, Brunei, uh, Darussalam, uh, Kazakhstan, Australia, since Australia is also part of a stronger, uh, the regional value chain in uh, Asia Pacific. Okay, thanks very much. And maybe over to you, uh, Yasu. I mean, I think we've, we've sort of addressed this question of, you know, the permanence versus the temporary nature of the re-diversion of these uh, supply chain networks. Um, but um, Yagao asks um, whether you think uh, the, the situation of these um, shifting of supply chains uh, causes path dependency. In other words, will the orders go back uh, to their, you know, to their previous parts once the, the pandemic is over? Uh, this is a very um, uh, important question, but at the same time, difficult to ask. Again, uh, I think it depends on um, how, um, uh, what is the nature of the uh, sector and products and investment. If, um, uh, uh, you know, um, uh, uh, production involves uh, uh, relatively large uh, initial uh, uh, investment, then, um, um, you know, short-term uh, response and relocation can uh, continue. But uh, um, other sectors relatively easy to relocate. Of course, uh, uh, can be um, reassuring can be a uh, short-term uh, uh, because after uh, uh, recovery, uh, uh, in all the relocated uh, uh, investment can be returned back to the pre-COVID-19 uh, pattern. So I think it depends on um, economic structure. But uh, overall, I don't see, uh, actually, unexpectedly, I would say, um, uh, the um, uh, uh, impact of a relocation, permanent sign of a relocation seems to be much smaller than our prior uh, ex expectation overall. But it depends on the uh, sector and also country and region. Um, in fact, like, you know, just uh, wanted to highlight uh, the Mia Mikic, uh, the former director of ASCAP, uh, commented that, uh, you know, reshaping uh, the supply chain is not costless. I mean, they, these do involve a high cost, uh, moving the uh, physical factory to a, or a certain other countries and, uh, you know, uh, re penetrating a uh, different sort of a value chain is going to be quite costly. So it does uh, depend on uh, which location, uh, also depends on which sector, like uh, most likely that uh, these uh, uh, thoughts are going to be much more longer term. Um, you know, as, as I uh, again highlight, the results that we were showing really based on, uh, you know, simulation, computer simulation, <laughs> it doesn't really consider all that uh, cost of uh, relocating the physical factory. <laughs> and there's a, none of necessarily physical, there are a lot of software issues as well. Sure, sure. Yeah, not decisions taken lightly, <laughs> right? Uh, they have cost implications. Uh, we haven't really addressed the, the digitalization aspect of the report yet. So I'd like to get to a question from uh, Bishwa, if I'm pronouncing that correctly, asking, uh, can you suggest how regional cooperation can improve digital connectivity in Asia and the Pacific and what ADB can do to address digital ex exclusion? Uh, across countries in the region. We know that exclusion is, is still an issue. Um, in the uh, report uh, did investigate uh, you know, e-readiness across countries in the region. In fact, uh, there's a large variation. It's not only necessarily just across borders. There are, uh, you know, even within border, there are large variations of e-readiness. Uh, you know, we call, uh, you know, digital divide. Uh, uh, interestingly, um, digital divide are 
very much uh, associated with existing inequalities, existing barriers uh, to the social inclusion. And uh, this, uh, you know, like a, not, it's not, uh, this requires much more than just uh, providing the physical connectivity. Having said that, still the physical connectivity will be the first thing that we need to address. That there are uh, still large part of the, uh, you know, the population not having a proper access to uh, safe and then uh, efficient um, the, uh, you know, the digital connectivity, in, uh, especially the like high speed broadband and the mobile connectivity, and uh, also not having the proper the digital ID to allow them to use, uh, especially the digital payment options. Uh, so uh, many uh, of these uh, infrastructure uh, have to be addressed and then uh, ADB has been uh, investing quite heavily in strengthening the digital connectivity and then also um, you know, trying to raise the uh, awareness of people of uh, digital, uh, in the, you know, the digital sort of, uh, you know, the tools and then the mechanisms to participate in the uh, economic activities on digital platforms. Thanks very much. Um, and I think sort of related to that, I'd like to, to ask Yasu, and you may have some comments also, Sinyang. Um, Mia sends in a question uh, asking about digital technology and how significant of a role it will play in uh, easing the provision of cross-border professional services, given that people can't move from one country to the other. And even before the pandemic, of course, there are variable regulations in terms of uh, uh, people moving across borders to work. Uh, yeah, Yasu, do you have any views on that? Um, so th this is also um, um, uh, addressed in the uh, 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 report, uh, how, um, uh, you know, from the um, labor protection, as um, uh, Sinyong mentioned, digital divide is uh, one issue. We need to close to uh, closely uh, uh, track and watch. Um, uh, basically, this report said um, uh, digitalization can um, uh, support very strong, uh, robust uh, recovery from COVID-19 because uh, Asia, uh, although uh, many um, uh, people started using uh, uh, you know, digital transaction, but at the same time, there is a huge room uh, for you know, further digitalization to materialize in terms of uh, you know, market penetration rate. It's still low and uh, per capita expenses on digital uh, platform use is still relatively low. So there's a huge potential. And uh, so that um, uh, we can maximize this uh, benefit. And um, in the report, we have some uh, quantitative uh, assessment about this uh, role of digital um, uh, platform, digital economy, but at the same time, digital divide. And uh, I think uh, digital divide, uh, 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 of course, um, uh, inequality and uh, internet or data security issues, and also lack of a more fundamental uh, issue of a uh, competition and competition policy related issues. But uh, at the same time, uh, from a digital divide uh, 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 angle, I think uh, uh, how to make, um, uh, uh, you know, uh, in, in regional uh, cooperation uh, support this uh, uh, trend. And I think uh, this uh, one issue is uh, portability of not only services, but also uh, uh, human resources. And um, so I think uh, this is a part of uh, a very important um, uh, regional cooperation, uh, which must be uh, uh, really uh, work uh, 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 strongly uh, to sh share lessons and experience so that we can maximize uh, uh, not only single country, but also all the regional economies and country can maximize the benefit. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, if, if I may add just to one point, um, you know, there's uh, really uh, on the policy front, important to uh, you know, promote that the mutual recognition and acceptances of professional licenses for the, especially pro professional services to flow cross border. Uh, you know, we need to have uh, some harmonization of the regulatory framework and uh, trying to you know, at least uh, apply some sort of like a harmonized and then mutually recognized the licensing and then uh, uh, even throughout the uh, education system to allow the, uh, you know, some professional uh, expertise that we gain in our country can be recognized within, uh, within the region. I'd like to mention, we have a study for ASEAN, uh, GMS, Greater Mekong Subregion, uh, particularly looking at the portability of uh, these, uh, you know, human resources and skill sets. Yes, right. I'd like to add. Yeah. 
Absolutely, absolutely. Thanks very much, Yasu. Um, we've only got five minutes left, and I do want to get to a couple more questions before we sign off for the day, if we could. Um, you mentioned, Yasu, of course, differences within countries in terms of uh, access to, uh, to digital provisions and so forth, but also, also there are, of course, um, differences uh, within regions and between regions. We had a question here um, from Iskandar um, asking about why, uh, what are the main reasons that Central Asia is the least integrated sub-region in Asia? Could I ask you to speak sort of briefly to that? Um, yeah, yes, I think a, a detailed discussion uh, are given in the report, but basically, uh, you know, six uh, dimensions, trade and money, uh, regional value chain, um, infrastructure connectivity, movement of people, and also institutional uh, dimensions. Um, uh, Central Asia uh, were ranked uh, in the uh, lowest among the uh, sub-regions of Asia. I think uh, there is uh, some uh, nature of uh, economy. Uh, Central Asian countries are rather uh, connected more to uh, outside of Central Asia, other Asian uh, sub-regions as well as uh, other regions in the globe. So I think uh, that's the um, uh, basic uh, reason behind a uh, 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 low level of uh, uh, Central Asia in terms of RCI index and uh, the details that uh, you can uh, 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 check with our report. Sure thing, sure thing, thanks. Um, I, I thought that we would get to RCEP and CPTPP at some point, and we've got a question in here from Secret. Um, asking um, that the report or showed some income gains from RA, uh, RCEP through 2030. Does ADB have an assessment on its jobs impact? Moreover, and what sectors will likely reap most gains? Um, well, we are currently uh, doing some uh, analysis uh, in uh, RCEP, uh, in you know, in RCEP impact on uh, employment. Um, and uh, before we get to more details, sort of uh, you know, results, we uh, do have uh, some ideas. Like uh, usually, the skill uh, employment uh, will likely benefit more uh, from um, uh, you know from the uh, these uh, trade agreement in uh, more advanced economies and high. Uh, countries and then uh, also the labor intensive, uh, you know, the low skill uh, in the low income economies that will likely also benefit uh, from the uh, RCEP uh, agreement. Okay, thank you. Um, I realize we're getting close to the top of the hour, so I'll have one more uh, question, if I may. This is about what policies specifically could be put in place to reawaken Asia as uh, an FDI platform, despite the outlook, I, I think it means an FDI, perhaps a, a destination for investment, uh, despite the outlook uh, for the, uh, for a slow macroeconomic recovery in the region. Well, um, again, uh, the digitalization and then uh, in uh, reshaping of a global value chain, maybe not reassuring, but still uh, resilient the global value chain will require uh, quite a bit of uh, in reallocation of resources across the region. And uh, uh, countries that, that uh, adapted better to this uh, you know, uh, resource allocation by having a greater comparative advantage, usually meaning that we have a greater uh, you know, human capital. <laughs> and uh, uh, I think, uh, I believe in every uh, in every uh, you know the economic and sectors. Uh, the most important things are uh, still the you know the human capital labor and uh, countries do need to face uh, the uh, you know, strengthen uh, investment in education, skills training, especially in the digital sector, uh, as well as uh, also uh, trying to uh, narrow the gap uh, in uh, digital divide and uh, also. Uh, reaching the uh, last mile uh, in uh, in uh, you know give in, in distributing the development gains uh, through uh, better uh, you know the uh, like better uh, inclusive growth strategies uh, for post COVID. Thanks very much. People first. I like it. Yasu, any last word from you? So you know, in order to revive investment in Asia, I think um, as Sion already uh, mentioned and presented, we see some sign of a uh, uh, brownfield uh, investment is uh, coming back. Uh, but uh, I think uh, we have to be aware what's the restrictions um, um, uh, impeding, uh, uh, you know, FDI uh, flowing into uh, domestic industries uh, protection. 
uh, et cetera, et cetera. But the more, uh, according to our report, I would like to emphasize the um, uh, improving the overall investment climate, which is combined by uh, you know, uh, uh, robust uh, human resources. That's a quite key. So as highlighted in um, uh, this report, for example, bilateral investment treaties can be um, uh, better used in, uh, in order to facilitate the uh, revival of investment to Asia. So that's uh, uh, from me. Thank you. Okay, thanks very much, Yasu. Thank you very much, Sinyang. We have to wrap it up there. I'm really sorry we didn't get to the questions. Obviously, this is a huge topic as evidenced by the large, large number of questions that we've got coming in. So my apologies for those that we didn't get to, but I know that we tackled a lot of tough and very, very big issues. Uh, thank you again to Yasu and Sinyang. Um, please log in again on the 10th of March, uh, at 4 p.m. for the next Asian Impact webinar looking at ADB research in action. The webinar will look at financing for tech startups. Uh, we'll have two of our leading uh, ADB economists looking at how tech firms can get the equity, venture capital, and other funding that they need to be part of the recovery uh, for the Asian region. Join us then. Thank you.